The euro dollar futures curve inverted in early December 2021, and that meant something pretty bad for the global economy. Now, the question is, is it still inverted? And also, why did it invert? And has it inverted previously? What does it all mean, this esoteric measure of interest rates? Well, we have the man that's going to answer all those questions, Jeff Snyder, the head of global research for Alhambra Partners. Good morning, Jeff. Welcome to the show again. Good morning, Emil. Uh, as usual, euro dollar futures, a hot topic, and uh, I know it's one that everybody wants to get into, assuming they can stay awake through it, as we talked about before. Usually when you bring up euro dollar futures, it can be a little bit less than thrilling. So maybe we can spice it up a little bit with this, with the talking about inversion. You use that same line, Jeff, with your recent interview with George Gammon. You said, oh, who wants to learn about these interest rates and yield curves, boring, boring, boring. But it was a greatly attended live interview. A thousand people almost were on that live stream. Okay, so I think the same is going to be true of this show. Let's do a little bit 101. E Euro dollar futures, what are they? And then I'm going to ask you, have they ever inverted before? Yeah, what are they? What do they mean? And the funny thing is, as I was talking about with George, what they mean may not today may not be what they mean in the future which is that uh, there are a futures contract tied to three month LIBOR where you receive a fictional $1 million Euro dollar deposit, which is instead cash settled. So there's no actual $1 million Euro dollar deposit. Instead, this is basically a future bet on where you think three month LIBOR is going to be at certain points into the future. It's a futures contract. Therefore, we're talking about future expectations of three month LIBOR in particular. And why three month LIBOR? Because three-month LIBOR has, over the 50 or so years that it's been in existence, has become a, an ex extremely important, crucial benchmark rate for basically the entire fixed income system around the world. So if it's in U.S. dollars, it's credit, it's debt, it's derivatives, you better believe that three-month LIBOR is at the center of it all. So Eurodollar futures tied to three-month LIBOR, this is a very important market. It's a very important indication. And it's one that the Federal Reserve and regulators around the world absolutely hate and detest for reasons we don't need to get into here. We've talked about it before. And so there's a transition away from LIBOR, maybe. So long as LIBOR is still being priced in, at the Intercontinental Exchange, we can still talk about euro dollar futures, which relate to three-month LIBOR, which, by the way, there's a reason why LIBOR and euro dollar futures are used in these futures contracts, because we're talking about, most important of all, London interbank offered rate, euro dollar deposits. These are offshore US dollar denominated monetary and financial products. So it's basically the center of the center of the center of the global reserve currency universe, euro dollar futures, three month life. The people at the Eccles building will be very surprised to learn that they are not the center of the center of the center <laughs> yeah, of the monetary universe. I think universe. they know, Emil. They just don't want to, they don't want anybody else to know which in a nutshell is why they don't want LIBOR to exist much longer. You talked about that on the show with George, and I feel like we need to talk about Euro dollar futures but, and what they're doing now. But forgive me for going back to that interview with George. You talked about the fact that we are transitioning to a new rate away from LIBOR, for the reasons you explained, to something called SOFR, maybe. Did you talk about what might happen to Euro dollar futures? Because Jeff... Uh, as you just explained, they're based on LIBOR. And if LIBOR is going away, this is in a tiny market. If I understand it correctly, interest rate uh, derivatives would be the biggest market in the world, nominal value, then currencies, and then in this different category of uh, financial instruments, I believe euro dollar futures have been called the largest market in the world. And all of a sudden, the thing that they're based on is going away. Have you heard anything about what might happen to euro dollar futures once LIBOR is uh, pushed off the cliff? Well, I'm still not convinced that's the case, even though the market has, by, you know, by hook and by crook, been forced to use other rates. And in fact, the Federal Reserve and U.S. bank regulators have said, going back to 2014, when they formed the ARRC to develop a competing benchmark or an alternative benchmark to LIBOR, they have said, we want you to use SOFR, the, the, the Secured Overnight Financing Rate, SOFR. And the banking system has said repeatedly, no, we're not going to use SOFR because it makes absolutely no sense. It is not a replacement for the whole suite of LIBOR tenors. 
why the hell would you be making us use this unsuitable interest rate? And there's been this tug of war back and forth all the way until last year when regulators with egg all over their face, having pushed back deadlines already once, said, all right, December 31st, 2021 is a drop dead date. And then in the middle of the year, they said, well, it's only a drop dead date for two of the LIBOR tenors that nobody uses, the two week LIBOR as well as another one. And then they said, well, basically, we're not going to ban LIBOR, but if anybody uses LIBOR, any American bank that's under regulatory authority uses LIBOR, we're going to come down very, we're going to make your life miserable. We're going to subject you to all sorts of, we're going to make it really uncomfortable for you to, uh, to engage in, in actual business, which is sort of their way of pressuring people to use an alternative. Now, what the market said is, yeah, you've been forcing us, forcing the software rate on us, and we're not really sold on it. So some participants have turned to something called term SOFR, which is not a, a suitable replace, in my opinion, and I think the market agrees with me, not really a suitable opinion to live or a replacement to LIBOR either. Well, others have turned to something called Bisbee, which is a product put together by Bloomberg, as well as something called Ameririber that's been on the American exchange for a while. And I wouldn't doubt if at some point somebody cobbles together another set of competing rates that are even more perhaps private and convoluted, but maybe more, more suitable as an alternative to LIBOR because essentially what the regulators have demanded isn't a really good enough replacement. So where does the euro dollar futures fit into all this? Well, what's happening is by June 30th of 2023, which is next year, about 18 months from now, 17 months from now, what the regulators have demanded is that the Intercontinental Exchange no longer will provide LIBOR pricing whatsoever. They were forced in the middle of last year to uh, concede this concession essentially, because the banking system said, we, you can't just shut down LIBOR at the end of last year. I mean, that, that just isn't going to work. Even if we can't do new loan products and new, new, new um, contracts based on three-month LIBOR because you don't want us to, we still have to price this bushel full. I mean, this absolute enormous amount of fixed income and derivative products based on three-month LIBOR. Because number one, even though we've been talking about this for an entire decade, we still haven't settled on any of the fallback provisions that allow us to transfer from LIBOR to the next interest rate benchmark. So as it pertains specifically to euro dollar futures, they're still tied to three month LIBOR until the exchange regulators and market participants all come back, all come up with a suitable fallback provision that allows it to seamlessly transition from three month LIBOR to whatever the next rate will happen to be. And the fact that that hasn't been done before now is a huge indication, a huge red flag that just to how just to how unsuitable this whole process has been. So the answer for euro dollar futures to what is it going to go what's the what's the next benchmark going to be we don't really know what that is at this point and furthermore it's just anticipated that once that's decided on and once the fallback provisions are defined in the legal contract language on uh, July 1st of 2023 it'll be a different rate and everything will go smoothly for any New listeners to Euro Dollar University that are still hanging around. God bless you. Thank you very much. We were going to tell you why Euro Dollar futures were important and why they, if they're inverted, what does that mean for the global economy? And then we went down a rabbit hole that was just for our existing <laughs> listeners. Hopefully they found it interesting. For any new listeners that are still with us, Jeff, we explained what Euro Dollar futures were. And now just to give us a couple of uh, moments in time when the euro dollar futures curve inverted and then we'll talk about the the december version when it did inverted and then we'll talk about uh where we are today well the euro dollar futures curve that we keep referring to refers itself to when you look at the contract prices spaced out by three month intervals all the way into the future when you factor in the index and the price of the contracts and you come up with essentially a money curve that looks like a money curve, which means it's supposed to be upward sloping. So you start at a, at a, at a smaller or a lower immediate uh, projection of three-month LIBOR close to where it is today, and then it goes up from there. At least that's how it's supposed to look because money curves, the beauty, the beauty that's embedded inside them, this optimism about the future, we always think ahead and we think things are going to be good, things are going to be better. And contrary to what everybody's been taught, Higher rates, especially when you're in a low rate regime, higher rates are actually a good sign. They're actually a, a signal that the market is saying, we're very optimistic about the future, so we think interest rates are going to be upward sloping all the way past the foreseeable time horizon. So when we look, it doesn't have to be very steep, but upward sloping is normal. It's healthy. It's good. 
If we see an inverted curve, that simply means that Euro dollar futures at some point along the way no longer are upward sloping. That curve then starts to bend and kink. And in some places, it might even turn upside down where the contracts become entirely misaligned. So you have the price of one closer to, to the current day actually less than the price of one that's a little bit further down the curve, which means sort of a probability distribution where the market is saying, we're not so certain that interest rates are going to continue upward into the future, that things are going to be awful, awesome and healthy and nice and normal. We actually think there's a chance and we're starting to actively hedge against some non-specific future uh, occurrence wherein something bad happens, where interest rates that were supposed to go up suddenly maybe have a chance of going down. We don't know when that is. For now, all we know is in the slightly inverted euro dollar futures curve, that tells us that the market is actively hedging in this very deep, liquid, sophisticated market for some unforeseen or unknowable bad set of circumstances where the probabilities are no longer, they're, they're too much to ignore that we have to hedge against them right now. Now, it doesn't mean something's imminent. It doesn't mean the recession's gonna happen tomorrow. It just means that the curve has changed. The entire market perception has changed such that the more intermediate and longer, longer run perceptions about three month LIBOR, this key benchmark interest rate have changed that in a way that makes the curve inverted or kinked or what, flattened. It's, it's non-normal, it's ugly. It's a very, very definitive and historically validated signal of a rising uncertainty. It, at best, if not rising concern and alarm at worst. The proof is in the pudding. 2006 inversion. A little bit over a year later, we have the great global financial crisis. 2018 inversion. A little bit over a year and a half later, we have another global financial crisis brought about by COVID. Here we are again in late, no, early December 2021, and the curve inverted. And he told us, you know, it's a warning. Something's wrong in the future where we should be concerned, but going forward for the next few weeks, there should be dull. There shouldn't be any ex sort of excitement. Is that what came to pass? There was no excitement in the euro dollar futures curve. And then where are we now? Yeah, as we say, Emil, these things are processes. Even a market crash like 2008 wasn't, an, wasn't a just you know one-off, uh, it hit everybody all at once, surprise. It actually had been coming and it had been working, the markets had been working in that direction for two years before it happened. So when we talk about these inversions, we talk about you know, down cycles and, and deflationary cycles and all that, it doesn't mean that, okay, the curve is inverted, hello nightmare. It doesn't work that way. And so these are multi-month, if not multi-year processes where the market is starting to you know, tease out and price and look at and evaluate and analyze the set of realistic market factors as well as real economic factors around the world. And right now it looks like balance of probabilities, things are tilting toward the downside. That's really what this initial version is. Like we may have some suspicions about a downside, but now we're starting to see them become confirmed. So at this early stage, we're getting this, this impulse, this urge to start hedging against the downside case. Now, Jeff, I'm going to read from your blog post, by the way. This is where we're getting all the, our discussion points, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to read along, go to the Alhambra Partners website. Go to the January 14th post, and it was called Eurodollar Futures Curve Update. Spoiler, still inverted. There we go, spoiler. Jeff, the Eurodollar Futures Curve is probably wrong. And who do I turn to for this uh, guidance? The FOMC, as you explain. <clears throat> The FOMC says consumers are normalizing to high CPIs, inflation expectations, and the unemployment rate pictures a very tight labor market absolutely brimming with wage and therefore inflation potential. So the euro dollar futures market is wrong, unless this is just astrology that the FOMC is. <laughs> it's, I mean, that's, that's funny because, you know, I... We, we bring this up time and again. Every time the euro dollar futures curve inverts, the FOMC waves their arms and says, ah, we can't pay attention. The famous quote, that at least famous for us and you know, our euro dollar community from Bill Dudley in 2007, when he said, you know, the euro dollar futures curve had inverted before we ever saw the crisis in, in, in 2007. And here's Bill Dudley saying to the FOMC, oh, we can't take the futures curve at face value because it means that nobody's taking the other side of the trade. 
And it's one of those things where you say it is one of the most absurd things for anybody to say. Yeah, that's the point. The fact that nobody's taking the other side of the inversion trade means the market agrees with the inversion trade. The fact that it sticks around is the market saying whatever we were worried about sort of non-specifically a couple months ago, it started to become more and more specific. And that's really the point I was trying to make when when the first inverted, I think it was December 1st, right, Emil? I mean, the first day yes. of December, we saw this inversion. Everybody talked it up to Omicron fears and whatnot. But you could see the Euro dollar, Euro dollar futures curve flattening long before that point, going back into October, actually. So way long before Omicron. And when it finally inverted, what I wrote was, okay, put that thing in your back pocket. It's inverted, but it's probably not going to do much for any. It's going to be boring and uninteresting. It's probably stay a little bit inverted, maybe fluctuate around that level for the foreseeable future. So it's really not something you need to watch every day, let alone every minute, because history says this is a multi-month, if not longer, process where the market needs to store it out incoming information, incoming changes in character of the, the markets as well as the economy. And if, it, if that incoming information validates what, we're, what the, the fears or concerns that initially inverted the curve, then you'll see the curve start to invert a little bit more. And that's when things actually start to get really interesting. But so for this, you know, it's only been, what, six, seven weeks now since it inverted. So we're still in that initial phase where it's just kind of a little tiny bit kinked. But our point overall is the fact that it's inverted at anywhere around the curve is, is that initial warning sign. So we're kind of sitting here watching it, not expecting too much out of it for the, for, the, for, for the immediate future, waiting for it to either go away or for it to simply reach that point where it says something's, all those concerns that it first inverted back in December, those are being validated one after another and after another. And so the balance of probabilities of the, the future case aren't just tilted a little bit down to the downside, they're sort of sweeping toward the downside. And that's where we get into the 2018, as well as the 2006, 2007 example, which was about six or seven months into the inversion. The graph that I've pulled up now with my magic editing abilities shows the Euro dollar curve over different, uh, at different points in time, starting with December 3rd, where it was at its greatest kink, or sometime thereafter, because in the first few days, like a week after, it got even more kinked following the initial uh, turn down. Yeah, the first couple of days we had this unmute, which I mean, I said, hey, this thing is going to invert a little bit and then just nothing will happen. And of course, two days later, it inverted it by several basis points, which in the euro dollar futures land is a pretty stark and substantial move. And then it kind of just went back to normal. So it was the initial inversion was interesting, but then it went into its boring I'm just a little tiny bit inverted, but, but, but by the way, that's where we are this morning. This is what, January 21st, the Euro dollar futures curve still inverted. It's actually inverted a little bit more than it was when I wrote that article, but not a whole lot. It's still in that same general area of the curve. It's still there, which is kind of the overriding point I was trying to make, which is in this initial phase where it's just a tiny little bit inverted, all we're looking for is whether or not it sticks, whether or not it sticks around for more than just a couple of days or something. And here we are, January 21st, 2022, talking about an inversion that showed up in December 1st of 2021. So, so far, yeah, it's sticking around, which goes along with a whole bunch of other stuff that we talk about in fixed income and bond markets across the world. So, yeah, it's still there. People looking at this graph will notice that the yield curve itself has shifted upwards. And I want to ask you about that, but I want to ask, to ask you that question in part two of this episode, when we're going to be talking about yield curves and Fisherian deconstruction, and what the yield curve means, if it's higher, lower, how it's shaped, how its nominal rates are growing. So we'll save that discussion for part two. Before we go, Jeff, though, you did give us a very helpful do-it-yourself couple of links. So for people that are interested in finding out how the yield curve looks themselves, instead of waiting for you to update us, they can go to, again, this title is Eurodollar Futures Curve Update, spoiler, still inverted. And at the end of the article, you provide a couple of links where people can go and build their own Eurodollar Futures Curve. Jeff, anything else on this topic before we move on to part two? No, just briefly, people all the time ask where they can find the, find the prices for these contracts and do exactly what you just said, Emil, which is build their own curve. And yeah, it's, it's some of these contract prices, they're kind of hard to find. You don't see them. It's not like you can look, pull them up on Yahoo Finance or any of the, the mainstream media sites. Obviously, you can find, if you have access to Bloomberg, you can get the prices there. But 
Uh, if you have bar charts, they actually do have historical prices there going back to the year 2000, by the way, as a wealth of data at bar chart and so there are other places around the world, if around the internet. If you're just interested in looking at the, the just the current price of all the contracts up and down the curve, CME does 10 minute delayed uh, sort of real time pricing data for you there. As, as you said, Emil, the links are at the end of the article. So, you know, I don't plan on updating the euro dollar futures curve regularly unless something changes. It, for now, again, it's our thesis is, hey, it, it inverted in December. That's a warning sign. But we're still in this a multi-month initial process. So as long as it sticks around inverted, we know we're still within, we're still moving in the wrong direction, uh, even if it doesn't really change much between now and whenever the next phase actually begins. And that might be, that might be several months from now. We, we, we might not even talk about the euro dollar futures curve, except by say, hey, it's still inverted a little bit for the next four, five, six, who knows, several months. 